Uh, first slide, please. So why are we here today? Well, Sistock, some of you will know Sistock, some of you may not. Sistock is a 35-year-old business that is passionate about helping organizations to successfully land and embed complex organizational change. We work with organizations across all industries and geographies all around the world during periods of complex change and transformation. Uh, and we believe that we differ from other organizations in that this is what we're passionate about. This is what we do. There are many organizations who talk about change management, but this is this is what we do. This is what we're passionate about. We're proud of our independence and our autonomy. And so we can truly provide a fantastic service to our customers. So as I say, we've been working in change management or organizational change management, OCM, for about 30 years before it was even a thing, before it was a career, a profession. And in that time, we've continually looked, continually looked for ways to simplify and improve and enhance how we land change with our customers. And at the moment, we are very excited. We believe we're going through the biggest single change to change management uh, in our company's history, in the history of change management. Um, because we believe, uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, change management is not something soft and fluffy or even optional. We believe that change management, change management is absolutely essential uh, for the success of large complex programs of change. So for us, data enabling change will finally rid us as practitioners of this millstone that's been around our neck for such a long time. Data enabling change is going to revolutionize change management and augment it, we believe, from being a project level discussion to something that's discussed in the boardrooms around the world and the C-suites around the world. We believe that uh, machine learning and AI will eventually take uh, change management right up to that top level of, uh, level of every organization and be the top item on every executive's uh, leadership agenda. It's that revolutionary, we believe, here at Sysdoc. So looking forward to talking to you today for the next uh, 45 minutes or so before we have some Q&A. Um, very briefly, my name's Guy Sorrell. I'm the Managing Director of Sysdoc UK. I'm going to pass to my colleague Danny to introduce us. Yeah, thanks, Guy. Hi, everyone. As my as Guy said, my name's Sunny, and I've been at Sistook for nearly two years now um, as a senior transformational change consultant, but I've worked in change for the best part of, sort of six, seven years, predominantly from a HR change perspective. And now I'm dabbling in the world of systems, which is uh, a different kettle of fish. So, but it's enjoyable. And I'll hand over to Mike. Thanks, Danny. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Mike Whitaker. I'm a lead consultant with Sysdoc. I've worked with Sysdoc in change management programs for about, gosh, 13, 14 years now. Uh, prior to that, my background was sort of banking sector, working in both operational and management roles, uh, being on the receiving end of change, which gave me a passion and a desire to understand why was I having such variable experiences on the receiving end? You know, what's the difference that the, how do you make change land successfully with people? And I had interim spells working in training and development and also in HR business partnering, which I bring to the way I perform the role of change management. Guy, back to you. Thank you. That's great. So thank you, everybody, for joining the call. As I say, in the next 40 minutes or so, we'll be uh, talking through where we believe change management is going and then we'll have some time for some Q&A. Please do feel free to post any questions into the Q&A box in the Teams meeting. And I'm going to pass back to Mike for our first topic. OK, thank you, guys. So um, as this whole uh, webinar is about power of data and how we use data in landing change, um, I thought we'd start by just considering uh, some of the operational risks of, of not taking a data-led approach to managing change. Oh, multitasking, so that's good, somebody let them in. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna sort of call out some of those uh, operational risks as I see them, and then Danny's going to um, come in with some insights on possible mitigations for those risks. So I'm gonna start off, uh, Danny, if you're ready, I wanna talk about hidden cost of change. And for me, um, you know, what's really important here, the operational risk is really that these hidden costs we need to be aware of. And I'm sure everybody on the call is only too well aware of the fact that change is, is expensive to deliver. 
but not only in terms of financial cost, in terms of time, resources, bringing in external consultants, etc. But there's also for me the hidden cost of change, which is around the impact of change on our people, on their levels of engagement with the organisation, their, their morale. Uh, we, we sometimes see with programmes, we get a turnover, an increase in turnover of employees. We see attrition. Some cases, it's the opposite. The people disengage but stay in the organisation. Uh, that kind of survivor syndrome uh, effect when we deliver change and we don't address the people side uh, robustly. And obviously, these can then have consequences and again, sometimes unmeasured, unhidden costs in terms of a downturn in business performance. That, that needs to be thought about. So these are important pieces of data that for me, we need to measure, we need to track, we need to respond and address. So Danny, what's the, the mitigation for this? Yeah, so for us here, it's really all about understanding those people impacts, but actually investing that time upfront to include those people impacts, people benefits into your business case, which sometimes gets forgotten because we go a lot down sort of the technical changes or some of the logic changes, not necessarily thinking about some of the emotive or morale changes or behaviour changes that we might expect to happen as part of the change. So it's part of your business case, it's part of your impact assessments, really undersure, ensuring that we understand the people impacts, your plans cover the people side, all the way from your resourcing perspective through to how you think people might think, feel and act because the perceptions might be different to how you think they are compared to what they are in the organisation. It could be that how we might need to work differently and behave differently. Um, but remembering that these are really hard things to change and so we should be better placed by thinking about these right up front. And then finally, also about the sort of supporting the training and having that smooth, quick transition back up to productivity or back up to everyone coming over that change curve um, at the end of it. As I've said, it's very tempting to sit with the logic versus the emotion, but getting that in up front will really help you think about that through all of your programme and you should see better engagement as a result. Back to you, Mike, for your next risk. Thanks, Danny. OK, so uh, number two for me is around uh, how do we ensure and use the data available to us to make sure that we're focusing on uh, the right goals, i.e. with a risk being we focus on the wrong things. And and I guess by that, you know, from from some of my back past experience of programmes, the impetus for change um, often arises from uh, the immediate operational needs of an organisation. So that might be very visible and current pain points uh, that are impacting performance here and now, or it might be about addressing operational risks and issues. So, you know, a classic uh, in areas where we often get involved is sort of IT infrastructure risks, where we're looking at replacing redundant or old unsupported IT platforms. And sometimes it arises because the sponsor of the programme has a particular localised agenda or maybe a pet project that they're at a level of the organisation. They can they can push that to to be supported. But either way. Every organisation has a limit in terms of its resources, its capacity uh, in terms of what levels of change and what volume of change it can take on. And this slightly more reactive approach to responding to immediate operational lead can sometimes lead us to risk missing those more tactical or strategic opportunities that perhaps are slightly under the surface. They're not quite on the immediate operational radar or maybe they're a little bit over the horizon, but these are issues or risks coming towards us, competitor threats, et cetera, new players coming into our markets. So uh, how do we make sure that actually when we commit ourselves to embarking on programmes of change, that we're, we're not focusing on the wrong goals or perhaps we are focusing ourselves on the most important or valuable goals? Yeah, and with that, uh, comes to making sure that our goals are aligned uh, with the strategic objectives. So some people have a love-hate relationship with this phrase, but I'm going to use it in terms of making sure there's that golden thread that is linking us between the goals and outcomes of the, the change project that you're working on and the overall strategic narrative of your organisation. It just really helps to ensure everyone's working towards the same goals. They know how their role plays a part in that. There aren't any individualised agendas that could be taking you off course. And actually 
essentially it's time to recognize that if you feel that it's okay to pause realign and make sure that you are all working to the same priority it could also open up hidden opportunities that you might be missing by taking that sort of one step back to take two steps forward and by reviewing that alignment and make sure that you're really focusing your time and effort on the right things and the priorities for the organization and that you're all aligned sing from the same hymn sheet with that golden thread it also could increase if you are struggling with your sort of engagement at a senior leadership level uh, that it could increase the sort of the better engagement with those senior leaders as because they recognize that your goals are actually helping them to achieve the overall strategic goals and they can see how your program is playing a part in that so it just what should help overall engagement of your project team should help overall engagement of the people receiving the change that you're working on and also those senior leaderships as well so it's it's a good idea whether you love or hate the golden thread <laughs> thanks mike next one Great. thank you right so uh, my next one, uh, organisational environment, uh, and by way of a risk, I suppose where I'm driving this one, Danny, is over the over time, I've been involved in numerous projects where in many ways it looks like we're delivering the same initiative mm -hmm. into different clients, but actually it never lands the same way. And actually the actions and the activities we have to take uh, in order to be successful in delivering change, are different. And this this comes down to a range of other factors in terms of that organization's past experience of change, which they may have had painful, difficult experiences with major change programs in the past that increases their level of reluctance or resistance or lack of belief that this, this time round it's going to work. Um, conversely, obviously, positive experiences will lead to a, 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 an increase in terms of enthusiasm and potentially their appetite for change. The capacity of the organisation in terms of what else is going on around the organisation, what other disturbance, turbulence, whether that's operational environment or other change programmes, the capability, skills, experience of the organisation to actually lead and manage complex change programmes, or indeed some of the cultural elements of, you know, there's the old change management mantra that if change is counter-cultural, then change the change, because culture is such a powerful force that will will either determine the success or, or otherwise of, of the change programmes you're trying to implement. So what this teaches me is that a vanilla approach to the way in which we plan and execute change in organisations doesn't work. And therefore, we need to be thinking about how we can use data to help us understand how change will land. And we need that information up front. We need it early so that our change management strategies and plans take account of the, the different organisations. So let us have your thoughts on that, would you? Yeah, well, this one I have a particular, uh, particular love on. I don't know if it's the HR background or not, but actually really understanding your organisational environment, baselining the start of your journey by using some tools uh, can really help you set you up for success. So understanding that level of change maturity that you might have across the organisation, your change history, your current culture. At Sistock, we have a bit of a culture camera tool that we like to go in and use to really understand sort of the makeup, the DNA of the organisation that we're going in with so we can work out the best uh, ways to sort of manage that through the change program and essentially what this gives you is is rich data right at the start to sort of give you some insights and build a bit of an organizational risk profile before you can start you can then use that data to influence what you would look to put in place call out any specific actions that will help you address some of the concerns or there might be some really good things that come out of it that you could harness and leverage to get early adoption uh, as part of your change program um, you can then use these survey results as a bit of a benchmark so you can take them at the start and then you could use them and measure them through your program to see any shifts or changes so then you can have a bit more flexibility uh, through your approach to how you land so I really personally really like this one it might feel a little bit time consuming consuming at the start but again and I think we can see it reoccurring here is that time investment at the start and really planning and getting all this rich data in should help you land a more successful program through to the end um so yeah I love this one Mike but I could waffle on about it for ages so I'll hand back to you for our next next risk all right thank you Danny so okay we're on the home run now um on my risks 
installation rather than implementation. So really, I guess this is about, you know, change programs that can take quite a length of time, certainly a huge amount of energy and effort um, to, to get to the point of go live. And th there's often so much going on that actually our key stakeholders and uh, key resources in the organization are helping us get ready to deliver. They, they don't really have the time or the capacity to think beyond just going live. Um, and by the point of going live, they're pretty exhausted, burnt out, tired, and almost just want to get back to whatever the new normal is going to be. Um, to make it worse, we roll off often shortly <laughs> after Hypercare. The project team disbands and it's very much left in the hands of the business now. And yet we know that if the benefits aren't directly related to, for example, if the program was relating to a systems implementation, certain benefits will probably come on stream as soon as you switch on the new system and migrate over. But where there's behavioural change um, and new ways of working to that are critical to delivering the value from this change initiative, this often takes longer and it's harder for the organisation to sustain and embed. So. How do we break that uh, tendency to, to drop into that installation mindset rather than seeing the, the benefit of the longer haul into really driving out the value and the benefits? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to nick something that uh, is more your mantra, Mike, but I think it's fit here, which is to plan with the end in mind and look beyond just going live with your solution, whatever that may be, whether it's a technical one, whether it's a people solution, um, and making sure that you've got success messages in place to embed it properly. And again, doing that at the start and tracking that through, making sure that you've sort of achieved that return on investment that you set out in your business case. But also, sometimes what we don't do is review that business case through the project. We set it up at the start and then we get to the end and we go, did it work? Have we realised our benefits? And actually, there are lots of things that can happen during the, that period of time that can change it. So periodically reviewing that business case throughout the project and making sure you've got clear data points together so you know how you're going to measure that return on investment. We know that one of the trickiest changes to measure is sort of the behaviour changes rather than sort of any financial changes. So using those survey tools that we just mentioned to track those changes through and putting that up front as some of the way you're going to capture the data will help. So again, it's about bedding in those people measures, planning with the end in mind, what results you want to see right up front and making sure you hold yourself accountable to measuring that through your, your project end to end. Um, so that's on that one. Two more to go. Oh. Two more to go. Right. OK, uh, treating each change in isolation. So again, particularly in in, I guess, larger organisations, but it does happen in, in, in smaller companies as well, um, where we've got more than one initiative going on at the same time across the organisation. And yet so often projects are in running in silos and uh, there's no overarching consideration that uh, there could be um, in, you know, collateral alignments, implications around impacts, resources, etc. We just don't have visibility of that. Um, so you end up with overlapping goals and objectives. You can end up with impacted audience groups with mixed messages from different projects going to the same audiences. Often we'll find ourselves with conflicting priorities and, and pull on those resources. And, and sometimes when you, we talk about so often about the importance of benefit realisation in those scenarios where we're in these individual isolated projects, we end up with double counting of benefits. And then there's a bit of a bun fight over whether we can truly claim the value from our, our work. So how do we tackle that one, Danny? Yeah, so this one sounds simple, but can be tricky, which is all around our sort of portfolio management. So instead of looking at those projects, as you mentioned, in isolation, that doesn't set you up for success. Actually, your project's never going to be the only thing that's going on in your organisation. You can miss opportunities to align, could join forces by looking more holistically across all the different programmes you've got going on. It might highlight why you've got areas of duplication or overlapping roles that you could join together to streamline. Um, and as you mentioned, it could highlight where you've got really high impacted teams. It could allow you to call out risks around your organisation where you might have changes 
change fatigue, you might have potential heightened risk to how you run as an operation because you have lots of things changing at once in certain teams. So by looking holistically and having that portfolio management in place enables you to spot those dependencies, spot the overlaps and make some decisions based on what that data is providing you with. So it can also help to reduce risk on sort of operational performance as well. So it achieves what some of we mentioned. It could get you greater alignment on goals. It makes sure that everything you've got on your portfolio is actually helping you achieve the strategy. So you also might be able to take a bit of a priority checklist around how are we working on the right things as well. So there's a, there's a real mix in there. It sounds like a simple thing. But we do know it's tricky to, to set up and to get everyone bought into it. So um, we would encourage you to do it. But we recognise that, you know, for some areas, it can be a time consuming piece to, to pop into place. Mm. OK, thank you. So then finally, Danny, with all of these risks, the you know the mitigation is dependent upon us having access to, to additional information, additional data uh, and our ability then to process that information um, and, and, you know, help use it, to help us make informed decisions. And yet, actually, you know, with the advances we've seen already with technology, we're we're almost swamped with data. You can't see the wood for the trees. Um, you know that data, particularly in larger organisations, is often inconsistently sourced um, from different parts of the organisation, and sometimes therefore quite difficult to collate it uh, and present in a clear and focused way. And and the upshot of that often then is that. We, we fall back and to making perhaps slightly more subjective decisions than we'd really like to in the absence of clear, robust uh, information presented to us. Mm. So how do we how can we take advantage of the opportunities to mitigate that risk? Yeah, I think there's a few things for this one on me. One, there's obviously technology. So mm. we all know that technology is developed and in a minute, Guy's going to take us into the, the future of that. So we'll hear what we've got to say. There are, there are a lot of tools available now to help sort of standardise and manage your data consistently. That could be an option that you want to consider investing in. But we also know that your data outputs that you get are only really as good as the sort of clean and consistent data inputs. So we need to ensure that we've thought about right at the start again, what people data that we want to measure as part of the program that we go on. What outcomes are we looking for? What are we trying to achieve? What do we want to know? What information is going to provide that? And how do we collect that data to inform those to make sure it's clean and consistent? So how do you get that one source of truth? So taking some time up front to plan out those types of data points and how you're going to do it to make sure you get it clean and consistent will save you some headaches down the road. But also with all of the data, it's about how you engage your stakeholders with using that data. If I was going to summarise up sort of all the different risks, because as we said, data outputs are one thing, but it's about how you narrate that and how you storytell with that data, making sure that you understand the context, you understand how your audience needs to understand the data, how you eliminate clutter, focus that attention and make sure you use the right sort of visuals to explain what the data is telling you. So essentially, we're looking at humanising that data to make sure that the stakeholders can understand and you can start having those data informed decisions. So there's a few things in there, some technology investment, if you can't do that, actually, it's OK to just take some time to think through clear data points and data sets um, on that. So that's Thank all you. the risks and mitigations. Uh, so now I'll hand back to Guy, who's going to have a bit of a look into the future. Thank you very much, Danny. Thank you, Mike. So, yeah, we've looked at some of the organisational risks that uh, change management typically mitigates. We've looked at some of the mitigations and Danny, towards the end, started to touch on uh, how we're using data to enable more effective organisational change and organisational change management. And here at Sysdoc, Sysdoc as I alluded earlier, uh, we are spearheading the evolution, not quite revolution, but the evolution of change management as a practice, as a profession. Um, and it'd be very easy, as, as many people do at this point, to launch into a treatise on AI and how AI is going to change the world, but I'm not going to do that. But I am going to take a, a brief glimpse into the future. So I'm a, I'm a huge movie fan, as anybody who knows me knows. And uh, anybody who knows me is probably expecting to quote a film or reference a film. So I'm just going to do, do just that at this point. So some of you with uh, a keen eye may have, may have made the link 
from a film perspective on screen. So the 2002 film, yes, 21 years ago, starring Tom Cruise, Minority Report, Tom Cruise is barely aged in those intervening 20 years, suggested that technology, with a bit of help in the case of the film from gifted humans, could help us predict the future. So Tom Cruise was the head of the pre-crimes department of the Washington DC Police Department, and he used data and analytics and some gifted humans uh, to pre predict when crimes were going to be committed before they were. So very, exci very exciting, very fanciful at the time and very, very much something that we couldn't probably get our heads around 20 years ago. However, we are actually getting very close to that possibility with the advent of big data, machine learning and, and yes, of course, AI. And at Sistock, we're starting to peek into the future and we're building as Danny started to allude, uh, a technology platform that will eventually help organisations to predict the likely outcome of a change or a, a change initiative before that change is underway, before projects are started, potentially even before funding is being committed by a, a senior manager. So fundamentally, we believe how we land change is going to change uh, for us as change professionals and people interested in change management. Um, so just like machine learning and generative AI, it's all about data. First off, it's all about data, understanding, again, as Danny said, understanding, gathering, interpreting data before we, long before we get excited about robots and AI taking over the world. And, and at Sistock, we're working with a number of organizations to start to gather that data in a very safe way um, to help them more effectively manage their change in their organizations, to help them more effectively allocate the right change management resources to different projects and identify any risks or blockers that might prevent the successful adoption of change. Fast forward a few years and we genuinely believe that we'll have the, uh, the quantity of data that will help us to, uh, that will be, enable us to help organizations to start to predict where change uh, the, the likely outcomes of change based on the data that we've gathered. Uh, so where change is potentially going to be successful, where it's going to struggle, where it's going to fail based on the analysis of the data that we're gathering. So as we gather more data with our clients, the more informed we and our, our customers, our clients and on our platform becomes. And through the interpreting of that data, we'll start to see trends and likely outcomes uh, of this work. So I'd suggest that the more we do this, the more it's become going to become part of how we work as change professionals. Um, so what does this mean for change management as a discipline? Um, instead of it being something to be afraid of, I think it's really exciting. It means that change professionals will uh, spend a lot less time gathering and crunching data and a little bit more time interpreting change management data and organisational data and sentiment data, something Danny's going to talk about in a few minutes. So potentially a new skill or a capability for change professionals. Um, but really the, the key is going to be understanding that data, interpreting that data and using our EQ, our emotional intelligence that most all slash most change managers have and working with leaders and stakeholders to um, help them shape the, the right change journey for their change initiative. initiative. So for, for us at Sistop, as long as organizations are still powered by people there will always be a need for organisational change management, the people, uh, the profession that sits behind it. But we really believe it's going to evolve as a, as a discipline and we're really excited about that. So that's our, our glimpse into the future. We're not quite there yet. We're on a journey, but it's a very exciting, exciting journey that we're on. <laughs> back to Mike. Right. Thanks, Guy. So um, I'm going to take us right back into um, the, the the here and now world of data. And um, this may seem, uh, the next few slides may seem uh, at face value quite simple, quite straightforward, uh, but actually that sometimes belies the significance and the importance of the, the, the question around the value in different types of data. Um, and so I just, uh, one of the benefits of us uh, hosting the webinar, we get to talk about the things that we think are important. And this is one of my hobby horses. Um, and I think we, you know, as consultants helping organisations through change, we need to spend more time thinking about the type of data that will actually be useful to us um, and not just uh, use the data that's readily available. 
And this quote from Einstein, I think, kind of sums it up for me. You know, not everything that can be counted counts. This whole thing about having almost being swamped with data just because data's there doesn't mean it's useful to us um, and we should be be focusing on it. But equally, the flip side of that in this quote, not everything that counts can be counted. There are important things that are quite difficult to measure. And if they're important, then we need to put the effort into trying to find ways to actually collect, analyze, interpret and, and make decisions on information that we can't necessarily readily count. So we go to the next slide then. Let's just break that down just a little bit further. Talking um, or thinking around quantitative data, then really I guess what I'm arguing is that when we're time pressured and we're resource constrained, then we do have a tendency to look for straightforward solutions that we can get hold of quickly. And I think we also have a natural bias towards using numerical data that we can easily count or measure. Um, it makes it straightforward to analyze and interpret. You know, we can put it into bar charts and tables, pie charts, percentages, etc. And presenting it in such an absolute way does tend to lead us to assume that the analysis that we are making and the conclusions that we're drawing is robust and reliable. You know, when we hear uh, it was a famous cat food advert when I was a little kid, you know, eight out of ten, ten cat owners said their cats preferred a particular brand of cat food. Really? That's, you know, that's just a classic for me. Um, is that really robust? Is that really reliable? Is that really the important piece of information that's going to persuade me of the right actions I now need to take? So my argument really is that quantitative data, whilst simple, straightforward and relatively easy to translate and put into presentable information, can be a blunt instrument and it can mask key nuances that we need to uh, tease out. I suppose Finally, a typical example for anybody that wants it, a quantitative piece of data would be answering the question, for example, following training, how confident are you about using the new process with a, a rating scale of one to five, one to ten, etc. A uh, classic numerical uh, scalable answer that we can quantify and bar chart, etc. OK, so we now move on to uh, the other side of the coin then and think a little bit about qualitative. So by qualitative data, I mean obviously the opposite, non-numerical data that often provides a description, an explanation. It provides context to what an individual is thinking or believing. On the downside, it does take more time to collect it and to analyse it. And sometimes when you've got uh, qualitative responses, you may need to do subsequent follow up activity. So it, it, it can be a bit more time and effort consuming. But it does provide us often with a deeper understanding of what individuals thinking or feeling. And so, you know, building on the previous example around training, a qualitative question would be following training. What additional support do you require? to be confident in using these new processes. And that will give us tangible specific elements in their response that might point us at additional requirements that at that stage, uh, with a volume of qualitative responses, we potentially could actually, in principle, apply quantitative techniques to analyze that volume of data. And I guess this is one of those areas where AI tools will start to help us in the future. So finally, um, if we move on to the last slide here, I suppose what I'm really trying to say is that it isn't really an either or option for us. I think there are merits in both quantitative and qualitative data, and it's the combination that will lead us to a richer, more valuable source um, of understanding in terms of the diverse views and opinions of our, our target populations. OK, so 
Now I'm just going to uh, hand back to Danny, who's going to talk about one of the methods we use to gather and analyse our data. Danny. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, so it is a nice segue on as if we planned it in terms of Mike's <laughs> spoken about our quantitative and qualitative data. And actually, in order to run that as part of a change programme, we need a way to capture that. And that's where Pulse comes in. So what's Pulse? It's a way that we sort of can capture colleague sentiment data, gathering information about how your colleagues are feeling about the change they're going through um, to get that emotive side. And you can also use quantitative questions and qualitative questions, as we said, to get those uh, training yes and no answers and actually what will the gaps tell us about it. But they're purposeful, they're short and they're quick temperature checks so that it's easy for people to access, easy for them to complete, doesn't feel that it's time consuming. And it's also something that you can use periodically to measure progress. So we could use this throughout a change project, for example, to measure the changes in how colleagues are feeling from start to end to allow that continuous feedback stream in between the project teams, the colleagues and sort of our senior leaders. So it's a tool to enable us to gather data in. But why use them? Why do we think they're beneficial? Well, one, uh, it means you can understand how the organisation's feeling about change over time. Um, like I said, you can measure it from start to finish. You can pinpoint certain things. And what it enables you to do is gather actionable insights and sort of the main word there being actionable. It means that you can allow to be more flexible in your change approach. You can put new actions in to make and manoeuvre your change plans along the way responding to some of the feedback that you're getting in by using the Pulse surveys. It also enables you to break down your data, whether that be demographically, um, to pinpoint any areas that might have for concern so that you can put some actions in place, but also highlight areas that are thriving um, and so that you can sort of lean on that and understand why and then take some of that to, to put into any areas that might not be thriving with the change and use some of that feedback to, to make some changes there. One of the ones that I think it helps significantly on, which we don't necessarily always talk about enough, is that ability to bridge the gap between our leaders' perceptions and the actual way that colleagues are feeling. Sometimes the perceptions can be different. We might think that we're doing this great transformation program and these are all the benefits, but how people are feeling about that could be different and perceived in a negative way versus a positive way that our leaders might be feeling about it. So it's an opportunity to gather that insight and start aligning leaders with their colleagues to make sure everyone is aware of how everyone's feeling. And they can also be used alongside focus groups, larger one off surveys. Some of you might have sort of an annual people survey that you run. You could compare some of the data or you could you could tag it on as part of that if you don't want to do it as periodically. But ultimately, for me, and this is one of the most important things, it's enable you to deliver a better colleague experience by using data. As long as you really create actions off the back of it and that the data you've gathered, people can see that you're listening, you're sharing it back, you are creating those actions and you're learning and it's adding value. That's where the real benefit comes in. And that's how you start to gather people on board of the change. The only con really, and one of the things that, that Mike touched on is about sort of time and resource to potentially analyze the data but that's why if you make them short and quick and snappy um you know six questions and under at regular endpoints it, it shouldn't be too time consuming to complete we use a tool called pulse at sysdoc that does some of that analysis um for us so it speeds up the process on that but as i mentioned earlier actually that's all good but you need to to take that data and that analysis and turn it into a narrative and what it's actually really telling you about the organisation and dealing with what actions are you going to put in place. And a good example of where I've used this recently is we sent out a survey to measure how different areas of the organisation we were working in were ready to go live. So were they aware of the change? Did they feel competent in the training that they'd had? So it gave us a real snapshot using quantitative and quality data of what we needed to quickly put in place to in order it to be successful. And we've also used it, like I said, to benchmark where we are and then measure the progress. So people are, are feeling more on board throughout the change at key milestones. So that sort of pros around Pulse, why you can use it, but recognising that, you know, you've got to make it fit for you and your organisation and sort of the technology that you have available to gather that data in. So that's a bit about Pulse and now I'll hand back to you, Guy, to wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. So in, in summary, <clears throat> bringing it all together, we've heard a bit from Mike. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've heard from Mike. We've heard from Danny about data, the, about the application of uh, sentiment data 
so I'd like to bring all these kind of topics we've discussed together before we move on to 10 minutes or so of Q&A. And I see we've got some questions already. But before we do move on, a, a brief soapbox moment for me as somebody who's been in the change management space for over 20 years. With those, of who are, those who are on the call who are change practitioners have probably all been on a, <coughs> excuse me, a program of change where ironically change is the first thing to get cut when the budgets are stretched, when time is reduced, when risk is being managed by, uh, by the owners of a project. Change is often, the first thing to get cut is often the last row on a project plan. Uh, and I've even been on projects where it's been so far down the project plan, it's even dropped off the plan altogether and disappeared. So that's been a, a challenge for us as, as change practitioners and change professionals, but insist on we believe Change, manage, change management should and will become the first line on every project plan, not the last thing to get cut. And we believe that projects need to, well, we need to reduce their scale of ambition, their timeline, their technology scope, the geographic scope, but not their change management scope. That they make it proportionate, but don't chop it. Uh, we, the world has been through three years of unbelievable, unprecedented change, and every single organization needs to change in order to survive, to stay relevant. So organizations are going to be continually changing now from, from now on. And so change management needs to be elevated to that, that executive, that C-suite agenda. Off my soapbox, back onto, back onto the topic. So today we've looked at organizational risk and how to mitigate it. We've looked at how data-enabled change is going to be the future of how uh, change is managed. We've looked at the different types of data, both quantitative and qualitative from Mike, and we've emphasized the importance of uh, the program and portfolio view of change, but also sentiment data and how that sentiment data is as essential at a project or program level as, as it is at an organizational level where it's, it's often captured today. So in summary, Organizations are gathering and using huge amounts of data to help run their businesses better these days with the, the technologies that most businesses run on uh, and, and helping them to mitigate organizational risk. And we believe that change management is very much heading the same direction with advanced analytics, that huge that gathering of huge amounts of data to identify patterns and mitigate change management risks. Organizations are using predictive analytics algorithms predicting potential risks, and so too will change management move into that space over the coming years, providing insights into optimizing timings for projects and potentially prioritization of, uh, of different projects, something we've done recently with one of our clients using one of our, our platforms. More than ever before, as Danny said, organizations are polling employee experience analytics and integrating those with HR platforms and organizational change projects and initiatives need to do just the same. Uh, just like the Pulse tool we've talked about, identifying areas of concern and effectiveness of change and, and integrating all of that data together to understand the sentiment of, of a team or of a, a workforce. Again, real-time monitoring of data is now commonplace across most organizations. So why not the same on portfolios of change? Why not real-time assessment of, of sentiment and assessment of how Issues are starting to emerge and again, in enabling those people powered adjustments to to our change planning. And then finally, just like most ERP pro, uh, platforms now offer, data visualization is going to be a really important part of change management moving forwards. The ability to visualize and then communicate with senior leaders, C-suite, executive, those data insights to help them make informed prioritizations, prioritization decisions for their businesses. So as I say, we've been doing this with a number of our customers recently, and it's, it's been very successful. We've looked at the data that we've gathered and interpreted it and presented it back to them. And as I say, in some cases, they have reprofiled and reprioritized their, their change agenda, thereby reducing their organizational risk. And then finally, obviously, it wouldn't be a SysDoc session not to talk about continuous improvement, which is one of our aviation principles. But we need to be looking at how we continuously improve how we're landing change through the application of all of the above, but particularly the data-led decisions, uh, data-led lessons learned for, for all future change initiatives. So as you can probably tell, we're all very excited about this in Sysdoc. If the things we've talked about are of interest to you, if you want to join us on the data-led change journey, if you're forward from a forward-thinking organization, we'd be very interested in hearing from you. And so if that's you, please do reach out. So thanks to Danny and Mike, and we're going to do some Q&A now that I see have been 
uh, compiling. I think Danny's going to take us through that. Yeah, so we've had uh, a few questions come in. So uh, I'll hand this one to you first, guys. So as a change manager, uh, I can see how tech like this would be extremely useful in an organisation that has more of a reactive approach to change. How would we sell it into C-suite? So I think I've, I've touched on this point a little bit. I think the point is um, that we as change professionals or people who are passionate about change, we need to augment the conversation around change management. For me, change management is risk management. Now, we've talked for the last couple of decades, or certainly Mike and I have, Danny's a bit younger, we've talked for the last couple of decades about managing risk on projects rather than managing organisational risk. But really, change management is is managing organisational risk. So we collectively, as a community, as people interested in change, have to start raising the profile of what we do. And as I say, every organisation, I speak to companies every day, and every single organisation has a change agenda for the next three to five years, whether that's technology change, organisational change, process change, cultural change, physical location change with the downsizing of, of many offices. So there is change is constantly happening. And for um, to manage that organisational risk, actually having the, the conversation around change at an executive level is, is going to be absolutely essential. Therefore, having the data and the visualisations to present recommendations is, is going to be a really key part of supporting that. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I think, I, so. I think, think your last, so, yeah, I'm just going to add, I think your last point there, Guy, about the, uh, the visualisation is so key. You know, C-suites, you have limited time in front of them. You've got to be really concise and precise in the key points that you're wanting to draw their attention to. Um, the fact that you can replicate uh, data visualizations and slice and dice uh, very quickly to give them their localized views across different functional areas or geographical, you know, however a C-suite board is made up, personalizing the data at the click of a, a button for them and showing them patterns and trends analysis, I think is really powerful, really, really powerful for a C-suite to see. Great. Uh, another question uh, we've got, and I might uh, share this one with you, Mike, to give your viewpoint, yeah. is can you share some of your specific examples on the types of data that you can utilise to lead your change? Specific examples of the types of data, say that again, to lead the change? Yeah, that you can utilise to lead your change. Oh my gosh. I'd start going through all of the different categories that I talked about on the operational risks, I suppose, at, at one level, because I absolutely at the front end of a piece of change want to achieve a couple of things. Number one, I want to make sure that what how that change has been defined ties back to the strategic objectives and priorities of an organisation. Why? Because I want executive level engagement and commitment to drive this change. If they don't see a connection to what's important to them at that senior level, then actually getting them to unlock resources, make key business decisions, give us the prioritization we need to get the work done to time is much harder. Second, I want to get that data out up front to understand the organizational context into which I'm landing my change because that's going to influence the shaping of my change management strategy. That's really important. Without that, I'm going in blind. I'm using a standard vanilla template of here's my toolkit, here's my comm strategy, here's my change plan, without knowing the nuances that I'll need to adapt to fit that organisation. I'm going to want your pulse tool, Danny. I'm going to want to know mm. levels of engagement and sentiment and their level of understanding. All of these areas, I think, are important to me. I would hope that um, with the use of improving technology and tools and some of the things that we've you know, talked about working on, I'm going to be able to do that more quickly, more succinctly than ever before. Because at the moment, doing that is a hugely manual job and I spend too much of my time at a manual operational level when actually the greatest value of the change management function is engaging in those discussions, presenting, debating, challenging, probing um, with senior stakeholders rather than uh, number crunching in Excel spreadsheets, which is where we tend to spend mm -hmm. too much of our time at the moment. Yeah, I think another one which if it's talking about utilising data that you might 
have that already exists so instead of grabbing new data that you need to sort of put in place we mentioned around most organizations do run an annual survey of some sort or biannual uh to understand sort of how everyone is getting on within the organization that tends to typically be an area around change or projects or transformation or uh, a comment section it gets highly noticed on and actually i would utilize some of that um, as part of the business case or change strategy and take the data from that organization that already exists instead of thinking about oh another program to address that actually use some of that feedback that's come in as part of that annual survey um that goes out to mm. actually put it into your program from the offset instead of having another program about how you address some of that actually start actioning it as a part of your project so any feedback on that so if if you don't have time to sort of start putting in some surveys up front there's some things that you could utilize you could also look at you mentioned it mike around sort of attrition rates that you might have depending on a closure or start of a project and whether that te is telling you anything in the organization so there are certain data points that you could use that already exist as well um what else have we got in here so we've got one which i can start on we've got one that says you touched on it briefly but in your opinion what does the future look like for a change manager or change team using a platform that collects data like this uh from a change manager's perspective it will save me so much time if i even just go past the data point the the time saving uh that it would put in instead of spending it on sort of analysis of it and the tools that would be available to do that analysis for you so you can spend your time on the real value add stuff in terms of using that data to drive the decisions I think is invaluable it also means that we can be more predictive and less reactive we just had a question about sort of reactive approach it changes the dial on that significantly from being a reactive project to a more proactive uh, project that you're running on so for me those are the two biggest things from a change manager's perspective but I don't know if you've got something to add on that Mike. I think the whole subject I agree entirely with firstly with what you said I think we can be far more valuable in the use of our time uh, with the benefit of it but actually it's then what do you what do we do with that time that we create that we free up for ourselves and I think Coming back to my earlier point about the amount of data that is out there and the the different things we could choose to measure. I think two things are going to come out of this. Number one, I think we as change managers actually have to understand and develop our skills around becoming better data analysts, because actually yeah. we have to build the model. We have to define the data sets that we want to look at. We have to work out the best way to analyze that data and present it in a way that facilitates the right kind of decision making. These are data analytical skills that I don't think most change managers necessarily have today. So I think that's one big part of it. The other, just flicking through some of the questions, is all about, you know, how do you get an organization to become more data focused, data led in its approaches? How do you get them to adopt or invest in all the things we're saying that don't happen today and should be done up front? Actually, you know what, for me, that's all about us becoming much better um, influencers, much better negotiators, actually understanding the role and complexities of leading in organizations not just understanding change management models and theories and tool sets actually the life and challenges of a c-suite leader and putting ourselves in their head space when we go in and talk to them and being able to negotiate and influence and debate with them confidently it's all well and good for you know the likes of Guy and I who've been operating for a number of years. We've, we've got the scars and we've learned the way. But actually, I think we've got a lot to do to develop those skills so that we can actually perform much better in that C-suite conversation. And I think we do today as change managers. We get, tend to get, often I find, brought in at the operational execution level, not at the strategic front end level and that's a completely different skill set and tool set I think that we need as change managers. Yeah and I know we are going to be uh, running up to time soon but there's a but another point in which is not sort of a question but I think it's a relevant uh, 
thing to sort of raise is it's interesting points around change management versus project management, which won't be unfamiliar to us. It's an ongoing uh, topic around the two roles and that when a hybrid approach is the most likely to deliver sustainable outcomes with having projects and change. But it seems a hard selling point to senior leadership sometimes when funding resources for major change projects and sort of where do they put their resources? So it's not necessarily a question, but an absolutely valid point that I know that we all uh, face with on a, on a daily basis in terms of seeing that value of change and project how they work together and that's how you get the best value out of that so I thought that was worthwhile yeah. point to raise. And, and Danny I think on that um, I've, I've just been with a Sysdoc uh, customer today hence the lanyard obviously um, and I was really excited when we went through the, the the structure of the project that they're running that the the project manager the program manager and the change manager are actually two in a box so there is a growing acknowledgement, a growing recognition of the importance of change over potentially technology influences within uh, the project. So it's it's a really positive way forward, but absolutely that intersection of change management data, project management data, and I would add benefits, benefits realization, benefits maps, that data, yeah. there's, there's a crossover there of, um, to demonstrate value to those uh, leaders yeah. that we've talked about. Yeah. Just I'm aware we've only got about 30 seconds left. Unfortunately. I'm going to take 10 of them and just say to build on what you said, if I may, um, for me, this is coming back to the skills I was talking about, being able to have those type of difficult, challenging conversations at that C-suite level, because actually, where does change begin? A business case was written mm -hmm. that said for this cost and investment, this is the return that we're going to deliver in most cases to to to, to shareholders. And actually, part of our role is to challenge the executive as to whether simply project managing this is actually going to deliver the benefits case. And I would argue in most cases it will not. Therefore, actually, the challenge has to be put at the executive's door. You need to invest in the change management piece in order to actually complete the circle and actually get the return on investment that you've promised your shareholders when you sign the business case. It's a challenging conversation, but it's one that we have to have and have the confidence that we can then support them in the execution and the delivery of that promise. And that's what I believe we, we need to go. And that's where I think this data led change and the tool sets that we're developing and looking to build in the future will help us. But back to you, Guy. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Danny. That's it. It is the witching hour. It's three o'clock. Thank you to everybody who's joined the webinar today. As you can see, we're very passionate about this topic, very excited about this topic. So if there were things of interest that have uh, piqued uh, your interest, anybody on the call, please do reach out to us. We are looking to work with forward thinking organizations who want to use data to drive informed decision making around change management. So if that's you, reach out to Danny, to Mike, myself or anybody else uh, you know from Sysdoc. We look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar, probably the other side of the summer. So have a great summer and uh, we will speak to you all soon, hopefully. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Ooh. That's everyone gone. Including Rochelle. <laughs> including Rochelle she was like I'm out of here let's let's join our other call I'm gonna I'm gonna call from that other call but well done okay. guys I thought that was fab you were both superstars see I'll see, call you in a second for five minutes okay